Julius Caesar is said to have written in his journal, because he was a big journaler, he released lots was of he? books. Was he a scrapbooker? Oh. He put, cut out little like fringing and added it in to give it some pizzazz. But he actually tried a fermented apple drink produced in the southeast of England when he tried to invade England in 55 BC. He turned up and went, What's, what do you got to drink here? We've obviously run out of wine or something, and what have you got? And uh, some local Celtic tribes who were trying to get rid of him gave him some cider and... They're probably just trying to get all the troops drunk so that they would go away. So they'd be or they just could a bit them. more friendly. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a lot easier to beat them if they're all drunk. <laughs> Welcome to The Dish, the show that uncovers the stories behind the world's most famous dishes. We are your hosts, Tomo and Megzi from foodfuntravel.com. Join us and expert guests with tasty facts, foodie secrets and more. In this episode, the history of alcoholic cider. From the earliest apple trees 50 million years ago to modern craft cider production, we discuss the story of how apples eventually became cider. As well as the earliest cider history from Europe, we discuss the story of hard cider in the USA. And cider actually became the absolute number one most drunk alcoholic beverage in the USA at that time. Wow. So heading for the 17th, 18th century, late 17th into the 18th century, because these apples were just growing everywhere. They were easy to grow. It was the perfect climate. Plus, we try the closest thing to ancient cider still being made today. The guy who makes these, what he does every year, it, it, his batches completely vary because all he does is whatever grows, just picks them all and blends them all together. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> that is the, yeah. tradi- that's the most traditional possible way to yeah. make alcohol. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Yeah, because it's just, it's just yeah. whatever apples they got on the tree, just throw them in. Stalks yeah. and all, leaves, whatever you got. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Dish. Yes, we are back to give you more infotainment about things we find near and dear to our hearts. Food and booze. Yep. And we're not doing a dish today. We're doing a beverage, which is sort of like a dish. I mean, I can sit down and just drink for a meal. Why not? Liquid, well, liquid meal. Don't they say a Guinness is a, is a liquid lunch? Guinness might be a meal in the glass, perhaps. But today we're talking about cider, which, you know, it's got a lot of fruit in it. So it's part of your five a day, right? Must be good for you then. It's got to be good for you. Yes, we are talking about cider. And we're going to go into some of the crazy history about cider. Where did it originally come from? What's going on with it today? How did it get to the point that it is now? But first up, before we even jump into any of that history, we need to we set a few definitions. We always have to set a few definitions because, of course, in North America, cider is uh, apple juice, not the alcoholic beverage that it is elsewhere. Oh, so like a 12-year-old can order a cider in America. Mm-hmm. But if they said they went in there and they'd be like, in the UK, can I have a cider? They'd be like, Dude, seriously. Well, in the olden days, 12-year-olds in America used to drink cider all the time with the alcohol in it. Well, that's because the the water wouldn't have been clean enough to drink. More on that later on. But yes, so of course, in North America, cider is the, it's a fresh apple juice made from the raw fruit rather than being the dodgy apple juice that you buy in a supermarket that's made from concentrate with lots of sugar added to it. I'm not a fan of apple juice. I have to say, like, even when I was a kid, I have straight up never been a fan of apple juice. But I'm coming around to a cider, being uh, married to a Somerset boy. Because it's got alcohol in it. Well, yeah, it could be just the alcohol I'm coming around to. I'm still not happy to sit down and drink an apple juice, but I will give cider a try. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? So, yeah, the cider we're talking about today is what Americans call hard cider, is alcoholic cider, and that is what it is in the rest of the world. It's just called cider. That's just cider. Yeah, we just call it cider in Australia. But, yeah, so cider can be made from lots of different fruits, but the most common variety is, of course, apple cider. But you can also get stuff like perry, which is pear cider. That's pretty popular in the UK, actually. And lots of other different crazy varieties are coming out of the woodwork these days as well, like strawberry cider, rhubarb cider, passion fruit cider. Oh. And lots of other different things. So pretty much any fruit can be made into cider, but apple's the big one. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. All right. Before we get started, just quickly a reminder, please subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen and leave us a five-star review if you like the show. This helps us get up the ratings, which gets us more listeners and more listeners equals more 
episodes being published by us. Uh, also, just a quick mention, I am from a place called Somerset in the UK, which is in the West Country, the west side of England, about two hours drive west of London. And we're going to be mentioning that a few times, just in case you weren't aware of where it was already. So in North America, regular cider is raw pressed apples, as opposed to apple juice, which is, of course, apple juice, which has been filtered and pasteurized and all that sort of stuff and is often made from concentrate. So yeah, cider, non-alcoholic in America, in the UK and everywhere else, it is the alcoholic version. But also when it comes to alcoholic cider, we can also talk about something like scrumpy, which is something... That West Country people like me would call scrumpy. Yeah. Go and have myself some scrumpy. I'd never heard that term before I, I visited your homeland. So scrumpy is like the alcoholic version of complete raw, just apple juice dirtiness. It's just like throwing all the apples in, adding as much alcohol as possible, well, creating as much alcohol as possible. That's so scrumpy. It's dirty farmer hooch. It is dirty farmer hooch. It's cloudy. It's rarely filtered. It is the naughtiest of all stuff. It can be like 12, 13% alcohol. It's pretty dirty, but it, it's also pretty good. And it's a Somerset tradition. And it all comes from apples and everyone knows an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Or, you know, you get really drunk and keeps the doctor coming down to check your liver out. So <laughs> who knows? An apple a day keeps the doctor in business. Yes, it, uh, with, with the West Country apples in this form, certainly does. So, yeah, uh, that's scrumpy cider and apple juice and hard cider. And that's all the difference. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about the traditional, normal sort of alcoholic cider that the rest of the world has known and loved for thousands of years, in fact. Thousands, huh? I only mm. found out about it like a few years ago, to be honest. So I'm looking forward to this episode because uh, Tomo's done all the research in this one. So I am just. I'm just taking it all in like everybody else. Yep. So no more talk of fresh apple juice. Everything else we'll be talking about in this episode is alcoholic cider that's been fermented. So cider making in its most basic form is actually really simple, which is why it's been around for a long time. And as long as you know how to do fermentation, which humans have for thousands of years, then you can throw apples in, uh, you crush them up into a pulp, then press that pulp to get some juice out of it. And that raw juice with natural yeast and a little bit of air and stuff starts converting the sugars from the apples straight into alcohol. That's the raw, most basic form. After some time of natural fermentation going on, the best part of the mixture can then be transferred to a second vessel, leaving behind the sediment, because you don't want to drink sediment. Get rid of that. Ew, ew. And then if you reduce the amount of oxygen in the tub by basically filling the liquid right to the top so there's not that much liquid in there, that second fermentation stage then goes on to produce a better product. So uh, the modern process has loads of different steps and methods for creating a much better product than used to be created thousands of years ago. Uh, and those original ciders probably didn't have that second step. It was literally just throw apples in a tub, natural yeasts in the air, starts to ferment, etc. Would have been pretty rough. Pretty dirty stuff originally. I can imagine cloudy, really just cloudy, cloudy liquid. Yeah. The people are like, yeah, that's good enough. Lots of rotten barrels that didn't work quite right because oh. they weren't quite sure what they were doing. You know how these sort of things stink. work. Stink. Yeah. But, you know, if you get it right, then you create this crazy alcoholic liquid with all these apples. Um, so, historically, some of the biggest lovers of cider around the world have been the UK, especially the Southwest where I grew up, around Bristol, Somerset other counties, Gloucestershire, and uh, most of the south of the UK, actually, because there's lots of apples down there. Also, France, northern Spain. But the question in this episode to start with is who actually got on the cider train first? Was it the Western Europeans? Or had cider maybe been produced somewhere else in the world long before that? Well, that is interesting because, I mean, when you come down to it, it's fermented apples, isn't it? Exactly. So, ba, ba, ba. And that's where we're going to start because you can't make apple cider without apples. So one of the keys oh, yeah, to trying so to find... Oh, yeah, so where did apples come from? Where did apples come from? And uh, this is quite a crazy story. The history of the apple, an important starting stage for cider. So the modern cultivated apple that we get all the time, millions of them all over the world, actually descends from the wild apples of Central Asia, probably around the south of Kazakhstan, modern day Kazakhstan. No way. Yeah. And the primary ancestor to commercial apples has the Latin name Malus Siversi. Be careful with how you say these things because there's a lot of Latin names for lots of different types of apples and they all sound almost the same. So Malus Siversi or Siversi. Um, those still grow wild in the Kazakhstan region and that specific type of apple 
has been around in that region for at least 6,000 years. That actually kind of blows my mind a bit because I, we haven't actually been to Kazakhstan yet, but we do have a lot of friends that have been there. But from the pictures that I've seen, I don't recall an abundance of apple orchards. <laughs> it's not the first thing you think of. No, it's, it's not like, oh, Kazakhstan, yeah, let's go get some apples. It's, yeah, you, I never would have thought that. That's very interesting. Well, actually, the largest city in this region of Kazakhstan, it's the south part of Kazakhstan, so it's a little less barren maybe than the north part that you've seen photos of where the capital is. Uh, in the south, the city is called Almaty, and the etymology of the word for that city and the ancient etymology of how that word has been derived over time, uh, there's actually some disputed translations, but they all involve apples. Uh, the name may mean full of apples, apple mountain, or Grandfather of Apples, hmm. the actual name of the city. Crazy, hey? And so the city and region around it have this archaeological history of human settlement dating back to at least around 1000 BC. So the apples were there before the humans were, of course. Uh, but actually, some scientists believe that early forms of apple trees may have been around on Earth for at least 50 million years. What? Yeah. So like those... Vegetarian dinosaurs were just chowing down on no, some apples. No, no, this is like post meteorite dinosaurs died and I then know, apple my trees. History. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's quite ancient history. You can't keep up on all of it, right? I just know that dinosaurs are old. <laughs> Jeez. Dinosaurs died out around 65 million years ago, and some scientists at least believe that apple trees were something that came after that in the next stage when vegetation came back and animals and mammals came back. Apple trees were one of the, the early sort of plants. Cuckoo crazy times. And they actually populated pretty much every part of every temperate zone in the Northern Hemisphere. They just spread. They just went nuts. Yeah. It just all over the place, all different types of apple trees. And of course, at that point, there wasn't really a human interference going on. No, so it's... it was just a natural process of apple trees just spreading and spreading Birds and spreading. Birds collecting them, taking them elsewhere, and they just like sp spread across the land. Well, yeah, definitely. Animals were involved. Actually, the- Are you going to the... tell me birds went around then? Is that the next thing? <laughs> <laughs> That's not part of this episode. <laughs> Could be a different show, the uh, the ontological show, ontological show. Oh wow, there's a new podcast idea. <laughs> Welcome to the ontological show, everyone. This is our birds episode. <laughs> birds eat apple seeds, and then <laughs> they take them around the planet. Oh, subscribe me, subscribe me now. Sign up now to our Patreon account, ontologicalpodcast.com. <laughs> Give us some donations. We'll talk more about birds. Sorry to all the bird lovers out there. I just defended everybody. <laughs> well, it happens. So, yeah, there's loads of apples all over the planet. By this time we're talking about in Kazakhstan, we're saying like 6,000 BC is when that apple tree was there. But what I'm actually saying is that the apples we have today, the apples we eat today, the descendants. common apples, they're descendants from these trees in Kazakhstan. Yeah, that's crazy cool. So all, all we're saying is that the scientists who've looked at apples have gone, well, the oldest trees that we found that are directly ancestors of apples we eat today all over the world at farmed, farmed apples, cultivated apples, come from those plants. There might have been other plants. I mean, and over time, plants have interbred. And of course, there's lots of crazy stuff going on. But those trees are still there. You crazy. can go to Kazakhstan. And there is an article about this somewhere uh, online that I read. Some of our scientists went to Kazakhstan and they just walked around tasting all these different apples and all the trees from these trees that are genetically connected to the apples we eat today cultivated apples very cool so those are the closest relatives that we know of you don't think of stuff we have today as being that old well you'd hope the ones we have today they grew more recently uh, so that's yes. why well They're you know fresher. you cut an apple in half of it and it's like brown in five freaking minutes so <laughs> yeah you'd hope it'd be a bit fresher now so yeah, as you mentioned, animals were involved in the natural spread of apples before humans were there. I know was crocodiles it, were around. Was it yeah, were crocodiles around in Kazakhstan? <laughs> Central no. Kazakhstan? I don't know. When did Pangea break up? <laughs> uh, a, a lot more recently than 6000 BC. Let's just say that. I don't have the exact dates on me. <laughs> <laughs> so we can, we can pretty much gather that it was crocodiles. Cool. Moving okay. on. All right, so apart from crocodiles, which weren't involved, um, the, actually bears still today grab apples off trees, eat them, and then, of course, bears defecate in the woods, as we know, cause it's, and then they defecate the seeds. So that's pretty crazy, isn't it, really? But yeah, other animals would have eaten them as well. But of course, bears, are, they're roaming creatures, so they might roam large territories and then not come back to the same place for ages. They're, they're like that. They're loners. 
and I like to have a, a lonely dump. <laughs> well, who doesn't? <laughs> you know, it's not a group affair. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> no. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it could many different animals, but today even bears are still doing it. They're still spreading apples around the world. Oh, there you go. Although much more limited status now that humans have taken over everything. But around the wilds of Kazakhstan, some bears are doing that sort of thing. So, yeah, trees would have spread all over the place. Now, directly descended, as I said, modern apples are directly descended from this specific Kazakhstan apple that still exists. Um, the original wild apple from Kazakhstan has eventually become this cultivated apple called Malus Pumila. Another complicated Latin word. So, the common cultivated apple spread from Central Asia, at least from the time of Alexander the Great, because he turned up to that sort of region in the 4th century BC. And then later, the Romans, and through other parts of Europe, and into the UK as well, well mm -hmm. slightly drinking nation. This specific genetic version of the apples slowly has been improved over centuries through selective planting. And this modern one, the Malus Pumilla, includes all, and I mean pretty much every single one, of every famous apple we eat today, including Granny Smith, Fuji, Bramley Apples, Cox's, Pink Lady, Red Delicious, Golden Delicious. These all come from this one specific genetic strain that was an adaption of the original Kazakhstani one. You know, as a, when I was a kid, I actually thought that Fuji apples came from Japan. Oh, well, I didn't do any research on that. I still thought they came from Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they came from Kazakhstan, obviously. Well, I mean, originally, maybe, but um, Japan is also an apple-growing nation, so they could have taken these and created so the Fuji apple. they did come from... All of these different do apples... Do I have to Google this? I'll just... Maybe you do, Wait, but let's... all of these different apples are grown in all different places around the world, and they may have been created in a new country. Like, there are apples that were created in America, but they're all descended from Kazakhstan, and they never grew anywhere else until they were grown in America. So that's how crazy it is. Hey Google, where do Fuji apples come from? According to Stamilt, Fuji apples were developed in the late 1930s by growers at the Tohoku Research Station in Fujisaki, Japan. Well, that sounds like Japan to me. Yeah. Yeah, Fuji apples do come from Japan, but they come from Kazakhstan, but they come from Japan. All right. Because they're new. They're a new strain of apple from the same genetic ancestor. However, when it comes to cider, it's hard to say if the first cider would have been made from apples descended from this great granddaddy of every apple we eat today, or if it was originally made from crab apples. What's a crab apple? So crab apples are wild apples. Now, although every modern apple that we eat today that's a culinary apple comes from this particular Malus Pumilla, that's the adaption of the Kazakhstan one, as I said, apple trees have been around the temperate zone of Northern Hemisphere for 50 million years. So they already had other types of apples, other genetic strains, all over the entire Northern Hemisphere. Oh, but it's just the ones we like are from Kazakhstan. All of the ones that we eat that are now used as culinary apples have come from Kazakhstan, okay, genetically. Gotcha. But the planet was covered in apple trees, and they're all different types of apples, and they've all got different families. And if you look this up, the list of Latin names for different types of apple trees, there's like, even just on Wikipedia, there's like 40 and none of those are related to any of the apples that we eat. All of those are just like crab apples, which are like wild apples. But an apple's just an apple. So, no, pretty much every apple we eat is one strain, which originally came from Kazakhstan. And that original Kazakhstani one is crab apples. That was a crab apple as well. That was a wild apple. But that one strain that was a crab apple has now led to every cultivated apple, pretty much every single one that we eat. However, cider, unlike apples that we eat, could have been made and probably was originally made from crab apples and not from modern eating apples, because even today, the apples that they use to make cider are not just the apples that we use for food. Well, that makes sense, because you keep... Like, and I'm assuming they turned it into hooch, because the apples tasted like crap. Pretty much. Yeah, so you keep the tasty ones for eating, and the other ones, you're like, well, I don't want it to go to waste. Let's see what we can do with this. Exactly. And fermentation time. Yeah. So they've got all this fruit that's being grown on these trees and you try to eat it and it's sour and nasty and horrible. And you go, what am I going to do with this? Well, all right, let's try fermenting it. See what happens with that. Oh, cider. Awesome. And so, that's the end of our show. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, apples everywhere, but completely inedible. I mean, they're not 
you can eat them. They're not poisonous. It's just no, that just gross. they taste horrible. And I mean, people might have used them if they added a lot of sweetness to them. They might have made jams and things like that. But they were not just picking them off a tree and eating them or chopping them up and putting them with their pork loin. Yeah. Like, yeah, they're horrible. So when you use them to make cider, then suddenly they're all right. So the European crab apple is called Malus silvestris. So very similar sounding to the other one, but different. And yeah, that's got nothing to do with the Kazakhstan apple at all. It's just a type of apple that grew up around European regions and definitely in the UK as well. All right. So how long exactly have people been making this hooch? Well, I'm getting to that. Okay. We haven't even finished the apple story okay, yet. Okay, continue. Continue. These apples definitely existed in the UK long before the apples that are now common eating apples were brought from Kazakhstan through Europe and eventually to the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, they spread them all around Europe because they tasted good. So mm. they went, let's grow these everywhere. And we all know that the Roman Empire was full of bears. Exactly. So, yeah, these crab apples taste. <laughs> it was full of bears. No, Europe was full of bears. No, I'm saying, like, I meant like the Roman army were always just. They're all, they just ate it, apples and they defecated them out. Well, yeah, all it, was, around it Europe. was an infantry of bears. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone thought it was humans, but they're, they're like, the Romans are coming! And it's like, it's these... Rah, 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 they're going to poop bears. apple seeds everywhere. It was, it was their responsibility. They took it very, you know, strongly. Uh, actually, the Romans had the technology to graft branches from apples and turn them into trees, so they weren't even just planting seeds. They were just the, stupid The Romans smart. were on the ball, so they didn't have to defecate the raw seeds out. <laughs> it wasn't essential. <laughs> So anyway, although you can make cider from any type of apple, modern ciders are made from lots of different types, including the ones that we know and love and eat, but also from these crab apples. And originally, that means you could have made cider from any crab apple because it works. And of course, alcoholic beverages keep really well. So if you've got all this fruit that you can't eat, that's basically just falling on the floor and being thrown away and tastes like rubbish, then why not turn it into something that you can drink for months and months and months and keeps really well during the winter or whatever? So apples have existed across Asia and Europe for all of recorded history, even longer. And the basic process of fermentation has been used by civilizations dating back to Neolithic times. So at least sort of like 3000 BC and way before, because in Georgia, they were making wine with fermentation, although they might not have known why it was working. But that was six, like 6000, 5000, 6000 BC. They were making wine. Um, so fermentation was a thing that people had noticed. Uh -huh. So... You know, cider could this have been made. the latest trend, like, you know, avocado on toast. Oh, well, no, that's an old trend now. What's, <laughs> what's new now? I, I don't know. Avocado on toast probably wasn't the most important thing in the 3000 BCs in central. No, I'm just talking about what's hip. It's like, oh, fermentation was hip. Just like avo on toast, <laughs> which I've been eating for years. Thank you. It wasn't. I think alcohol has been hip for a very long time. That's true. Do you know what's hip now? Moscow mules. They were hip in like the 90s and now they're hip again. They've come back again. I think it's just because the uh. little pots they serve them in. Anyway, cider. <laughs> so cider could have been produced on a small local scale pretty much anywhere, even by accident, just leaving some apples out that went a bit off. And Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it could have been any time. There's just no documentation of it. As an aside, actually, this is random. So apples were Adam and Eve making cider. <laughs> I, uh, they well, like all knowledge. Could I eat the apple or should I make some cider with it? And then so I can have a knowledgeable alcoholic beverage. They'd already taken the forbidden fruit and went, you know what? It's too late now. We're done. Let's make cider. <laughs> Let's have a party. Well, contrary to popular belief, the apple is not actually mentioned in the Old Testament Garden of Eden story at all. There is no apple. The forbidden fruit is not specified, and it's been debated by scholars for years as to what fruit it could have actually been. Isn't that interesting? Because it all, all, like, you know... It's children's Cartoons stories. and all stuff is all shown. They just chose big, a fruit. And it was a big red apple, right? Because red is like bad. It's popular fiction. That's mm. all it is. They've taken the forbidden fruit thing and gone, well, what would represent that well on TV? Apples, because everyone knows what they are and they, they grow all across the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, but, but also like what's red that means like danger. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, that as well. Lots of symbolism going on. But the Bible doesn't actually say anything about it being an, an apple. apple. And different scholars argue over whether it could have been figs 
Could have even been grapes. Imagine just have one little grape and you've done the like, Eden. Come on! Like, there's one grape! Uh, could be olives, apricots, pomegranates, grapefruit. They've all been suggested by scholars. I mean, I like the sound of olives, personally. I think that'd be a good, wise fruit. But also, you have one olive and you're like, come on! And you can't eat olives straight off the tree. They're horrible. Oh, that's true. So, I mean, they've messed that up, really, haven't they? Mm. Like, totally yeah, messed God, that up. Yeah, God, if you like, told you so, it tastes like crap, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, maybe that was the plan. Yeah. are like, what is this? And like, uh, joke's on you. <laughs> So anyway, that's uh, some of the the discussion of apples and some mythology. But what about actual historic evidence of cider production and consumption? So let's look at some of the earliest origins and documentation. So though the origin of simple home production is is lost, I mean, we could never really prove when that first happened. There are some early references to cider that are worth considering. So the first one that I've got here is Julius Caesar is said to have written in his journal, because he was a big journaler. He released lots was of he? books. Was he a scrapbooker? Oh, he put, I, cut out little like fringing and added it in to give it some pizzazz. I don't know. I haven't. I he haven't, seems like a scrapbooker I haven't to seen me. his scrapbooker. It, it seemed to be more pressed of a writer. Leaves, pressed leaves in there. Like, it could be. It could yeah, be. Yeah. But he actually tried a fermented apple drink produced in the southeast of England when he tried to invade England in 55 BC. He turned up and went, What's, what do you got to drink here? We've obviously run out of wine or something, and what have you got? And uh, some local Celtic tribes who were trying to get rid of him gave him some cider, and they're probably just trying to get all the troops drunk so that they would go away. So they'd be or just they could a bit more them. friendly. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a lot easier to beat them if they're all drunk. <laughs> so that's the first recorded evidence is Julius Caesar. That's one of the first recorded Okay. Evidence pieces. We're not there yet. But yeah, the first invasion was a complete failure. Julius Caesar had to go back to France, but he wrote down in his journal that there were these fermented apples being made by the locals and it was turning it into an alcoholic beverage. And of course, they had plenty of wine in Rome, so he knew what being drunk was like. It wasn't a surprise to him. Indeed. And he went, oh, this apple juice is fantastic. They already had apples around the rest of the world but he'd never had it as an alcoholic beverage before. Mm -hmm. So the recorded information suggests that as Caesar at that point had already conquered France, which was called Gaul at the time, uh, and he hadn't discovered cider there, but he did when he went over the channel into England, that that probably means France wasn't one of the front runners for creating cider, because otherwise he'd conquered the whole of France and he never got a cup of cider. Comes to England for like three weeks and cider. (laughs) Like It seems to suggest that's quite a strong thing that France wasn't first. Does France like claim to it or are they like france eh, is, maybe france is a really big cider producing country one of the best in the yeah, world but, you know australia is a really big pavlova making country <laughs> but it's it's not exactly ours well i mean the thing is they had apples and they knew how to make booze unlike england that was um they were not part of the roman empire they hadn't had like all of these different influences from rome france was if they were going to ferment something, they'd already fully know what they were doing and be able to do it. But it appears like it wasn't the case. Apparently, it seems like cider was something that Caesar found in England and France weren't doing it. All right. Sorry, uh, France. So, yeah, the Romans at this time had not brought modern apples to England. So if they were making cider, they would have been using crab apples, which were definitely present in England at that time, as they were everywhere. But the Romans did eventually take their modern apples, their Kazakhstan Descended apples to England when they went in for their second invasion about 100 years later and actually conquered England in 44 AD. And then apple culture went crazy in England. Mm -hmm. But before that, there would have been lots of crab apples in England. So they could easily have been making cider from that because you can't eat the damn things. So uh, further conjecture that apples were not being used to make cider elsewhere in the Roman Empire comes just mainly from a lack of documentation. So maybe, yeah, and they wrote everything down. Yeah, exactly. Caesar's writing everything down. He's doing these campaigns. He's gone through Gaul. He's gone to England. Never mentioned cider until that point. And other evidence also suggests, of course, they had apples, but they weren't using them for cider because there's actually some frescoes in Herculaneum and Pompeii, which are the cities destroyed by a volcano when mm-hmm. Vesuvius exploded. Uh, they depict apples being used in cooking. So they're they're actually there on the wall, like here are some apples in food. And there's a famous cookbook, which I think we discussed in another episode by Apicus from the first century AD. And he describes apples being used to accompany pork, but absolutely no mention of them being turned into cider at any point. So it sort of suggests like, yes, they were using apples for food, but no, no one had thought, hey, let's turn this into booze. I mean, ultimately, like England, North Europe has the perfect growing environment for apples. 
And as with all early history, locals use just products that they've got easy access to. So, you know. And also because if they were already making like wine, why they, they already sort of had their booze sorted. So it's not yeah. like someone was trying to invent the new thing. They already had a massive amount of agriculture devoted to making wine. It was one of their major exports. The Roman Empire exported it around the whole Mediterranean and beyond. It was one of their main trading things. So, yeah, why start turning everything into orchards when you've already got great growing environment for wine? And wine's actually easier to make. Hence why Georgia in, invented wine thousands of years ago rather than being Georgians invent the first alcohol, which is cider. Yeah. It's like they invented wine. It's really, really easy to make wine compared to cider. Okay, so what about other regions around Europe that had plenty of apples but maybe weren't growing as many grapes or grains for making beer? Because, of course, the Egyptians were making beer before this time. So beer was a thing that could have existed. I actually didn't know that. Egyptians were making beer before the turn of the millennium. So way before 55 BC. I think it's maybe as far back as 1300 BC. Uh, But yeah, because they had lots of grains. They made beer. Hmm. Obviously, we mentioned that France had great opportunity with apples, but they probably weren't making cider. But one other contesting claim is from northern Spain. So a region in the north part of Spain where the weather wasn't quite as good for grapes, but was excellent for apples. And this includes Galatia, the Principality of Asturias, Cantabria, as well as the Basque Country. And with really good climates for growing apples, cider is actually super, 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 super popular there today. And it's considered that the Principality of Asturias is actually the highest consumer per capita of cider in the whole of Europe, and that the average person drinks 54 litres per year, or 14 gallons per person. So they out- For the entire entire state. I don't mean like every person drinks this. I mean, if you divide the total (laughs) consumption for the state, divided by the amount of people who live there, 54 litres per person. Yeah, but you're saying like more people consume cider there than the West Country. Well, not necessarily because it's a very small area. Oh, okay. What I'm saying is for the amount of people that live there, they drink a, a lot. lot of cider. So how long has this love of cider been going on in northern Spain? That's the question. Now, there's lots of references to this Greek geographer called Strabo suggesting that cider drinking was going on in that region at least from 60 BC. So five years earlier than Julius Caesar discovering it in the UK. Now, I'm sure the UK didn't invent cider five years before Julius turned up as a welcome gift. (laughs) So, but who knows? We're just talking about actual references in literature here. What can we do to impress him? (laughs) If we get him drunk, he'll leave. (laughs) So, but this is just for documentation. We can't prove when it first happened, but for actual documented references. So I had a look at this and went, wow, they've predated by five years. Hmm. That sounds a bit controversial. It almost sounds like someone trying to do some marketing for the destination. Oh, is it? Because I thought it could have been, you know, benefit of the doubt is one of those things that, you know, just happened to occur at the exactly same time. Exactly five years before, so that it was yeah, the earliest no, actually, one. Yeah, now you say that, it's like, it, yeah. So I did a little digging, and this guy Strabo from Greece was born in 64 BC. So barring the possibility that he was sort of some drunk literary toddler, at four years old, writing about his amazing cider experiences on his blog, it seems like any such reference to a 60 BC as the date, nah. But it keeps coming up in these podcasts that there's some really genius toddlers getting around <laughs> Wikipedia. Yeah, a lot of genius toddlers in history, it seems, or more likely just poor historians not putting the dates right, and then it just gets spread around the internet as an internet myth. So um, his writings on the topic of cider in that region would have been compiled between 7 BC and 23 AD based on his age and his career. So this random date of 60 BC seems to have come out of nowhere. But of course, it's possible that what happened is, well, Strabo, he actually pretty much hung out in the Roman Empire and travelers would have come in and been like, I did this stuff and I did this stuff and this is stuff. And then he noted it all down about and like compiled a book based on other people's experiences. So he wasn't, it's very unlikely that he ever actually went to that region. So perhaps 
it's possible that someone came into Rome and went, oh, well, he was, well, he wouldn't have spoken like that when he gets the West Country. <laughs> like, when <laughs> I was. Anyone who drinks cider speaks like that, right? As soon as you drink it, you get the accent. Maybe he's a little Italian. So okay. maybe when he comes into Rome and he says, uh, I was in uh, Spain in 60 BC and I had uh, some cider as apple beverage. He called it 60 BC? Yeah. I said, well, I was here in uh, 60 BC. <laughs> and so, yeah, he told Strabo the story and Strabo went, oh, 60 BC, eh? I'll put that in the book. Is it, is, it, is it coincidence that Strabo sounds quite similar to Strongbow? That could be what's happened here. It's the original Strongbow. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe they got the inspiration from Strabo and just thought there'd be a copyright issue, so they didn't try to contest that. So, yeah, unlike Caesar, who actually definitely went to Britain and drank this and did a journal about it, and his journals were very tight. He's got so many that it's like, this year we did this. This year we did this. Yeah. Like his dates are pretty accurate. Whereas the Strabo thing, it's like other people's stories. Who knows? So, yeah, it's possible that North Spain, just like anywhere else, was already drinking cider at that time. But it seems more likely that the UK is going to clinch this one for actual documented evidence. All right. UK so, is the winner. Congrats, guys. From what I can tell, UK is definitely the first on the cider train with crab apples. And they were loving it. Yep. Choo choo. All aboard the cider train. All right, it's time to move cider forward a little bit. It's the, the, next, the next step from the original cider. Uh, though those crab apple ciders with the Celtic tribes in England might have been going on way before 55 BC because they had the fruit and they had the knowledge to ferment things. Although that may have been happening, cider production did start to change, of course, as apples from the continent were imported in, the ones that had originally been born from Kazakhstan. Yeah, because let's be honest. They brought them in. Crab apple sounds like crap apple. They still use crab apples today. I know, but it sounds horrible. I mean, the idea of biting into a crab apple, like if you've never had one. If you've never the- had crabs, which I haven't. <laughs> well, crab. Singular. Well, I've had a crab. I've had a crab. But it, it just doesn't sound pleasant. No, because they're not. Yeah. That's the reason everyone's like, yeah. But it doesn't taste like crab. No, it does not. Otherwise, it'd probably it probably be worth a lot more. crabs? I don't know. Maybe that was People an ancient cure that didn't work. a bunch work. of apples in their jocks and seeing how it went. Maybe it makes man strong. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of things that do that. Everything does, apparently. So um, after the Romans left England, which they did sometime during, well, the Dark Ages began because they left. They stopped documenting stuff and people stopped documenting things. So like as the Roman Empire started to break up, they left the UK. And eventually the Normans came in from France, 1066, quite famous for anyone knowing English history. They, uh, that was the last time England's been invaded in its whole history, 1066. We've done quite well. Uh, yeah. So they brought new types of apples as well, obviously based off this exact same Kazakhstan apple that everyone has got apples based off. So they turned up and they're like, hey guys, we just invaded you. Here's some apples. And like, Caesar gave them to us like years ago. But they brought even more new ones. Oh. Caesar took a few over. Well, Caesar didn't. He was already dead. His People. His people after him took Caesar over Jr. more apples. And now the Normans from France came over with even more apples. It's just apples crazy. It's a lot of apples. Yeah. For a specific written reference to cider in the UK, I mean, there's lots of there's references to apples, but for cider, the next one doesn't come until 1204 AD. Ah. That's like after the Romans left, that's a good like 800 years or something. But as you said, it was like the Dark Ages and people weren't doing like People didn't write stuff down. No. So in 1204 AD, there was a reference to cider as a form of payment by the manor at Runham in Norfolk. So they actually paid someone off like some service professional or I don't know, slave. I, no, they don't pay slaves. No. <laughs> they, they, they paid someone <laughs> they off. Paid they paid their plumber. They paid some sort of debt. Maybe they paid their plumber in cider. Um, paying stuff for cider. It's a barter economy 101. Why not? You're like, hey, well, this is what I got. Got some cider. Let's do it. That was the first written reference. But after that, uh, it just went cider crazy from there. So monks had preserved the knowledge of cider making throughout the centuries. Good on those monks. They just, they don't get laid, but they love drinking. That's monk classic stuff from the old times. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to get your jollies off somehow. It's actually noted that the Bishop of Bath and Wells, and Wells is the city where I grew up, in the West Country. Mm -hmm. The Bishop of Bath and Wells, it's in the southwest of England. He was the guy who ran those two cities and presided over 
the religion, as it were. He bought cider presses for his monastery in 1230. So it's like documented that he bought some cider presses. It's all about keeping up morale with your staff. Well, when they're not getting laid, what else have they got to do? Exactly. Um, so, yeah, he was doing his bit for the cider in 1230. And also famous serial monogamist Henry VIII didn't just marry a lot of people, but he also promoted... I actually thought you were going to say serial killer. And then when you continued, I was like, no, you're right. It, it, like, it's both. He's the most famous serial monogamist in history, right? He and just, killer. Yeah. Well, it just, well, he didn't kill them. He got his executor to execute them and stuff, right? Well, but he didn't you know, get married to two women. Charles at the same Manson time. didn't actually kill anyone either. But hey, <laughs> now we're a conspiracy podcast. <laughs> we're the ontological oh, bird no, society he conspiracy did. podcast. He didn't in the first. No, I think he actually did in the second round of murders. Anyway, who knows? Anyway, Henry the- on, we're going to edit that one out. <laughs> Henry VIII had a lot of wives, but consecutively. So he's a monogamist. Oh, that's just what the history books say. Well, he had a lot of other people on the side, but he didn't marry them. <laughs> yeah. And he always had one of the wives on the side before they became a wife. And Oh, he was a scoundrel. And that's why he died of syphilis. Yes. And also quite famous. So he promoted uh, more apples. He wanted more apples in the UK and cider. And he Clearly sent- not a cure for syphilis. <laughs> Apparently it didn't work. Or crabs. So there we go. <laughs> if you've got any downstairs diseases, apples are not the cure. But anyway, he got his top, <laughs> his top fruitier. I don't know if that's a word, but like a, like a musketeer, but a fruitier. And yeah. it's going out to find fruit. Dante, uh, the fruitier. Yeah, he's oh, the fruitier. Fruitier. Well, that sounds more French. See, because French, must, you said a fruitier or a fruitier. Who cares? Richard Harris was his guy, and he sent him to France to borrow some apples. And he brought back the Pippin apple to plant in the UK. So the apples, they already had plenty of apples in the UK, but they went, hey, let's get some more. Let's steal them off France. Henry VIII's that sort of guy. He's like, yeah, don't have something. I'll steal it. I want I'll get what it. They've, yeah. Well, hello. I want what they've got. Exactly. Yeah. I'll try that wife, please. Yeah. I want one of those wives. So as apple production grew further into the 17th century, cider became a very popular drink with the gentry, the popular ladies and gentlemen of the society, uh, often replacing wines. A lot of wine was imported from the continent so because English wine was terrible at that time. They Nothing's had it, true. but it was terrible. So apples, fantastic. All right, let's make this. Let's drink some homegrown stuff. And it wasn't that French stuff. They're like, oh, we don't want to drink that. French stuff. Because come on, British, this wars, this wars going on. You British can't get trade French all the time. notoriously like been battling each other, whether it be like in person or just verbally <laughs> for years. We and do like, have a local rivalry. What can I say? Yes, that's rivalry. That's the word I wanted. And yeah, so it's like we're not going to drink that French stuff. We're going to have these apples. They're French apples. Oh, but we made them. Here. <laughs> we, we stole them from. We, we France. stole them from. Oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> we turned them into now English they're... apple trees. <laughs> they were grown here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, everyone's been stealing off each other forever. That's the history of food. That's the summary of the history of food. We all stole everything off each other and made food better. Yep which is totally fine. And booze. We made booze better as well. And by the 18th century, more efficient production led to second pressing cider, where they used the leftover apple bits from the first pressing, which made the really good high alcohol stuff, to make a second pressing with lower alcohol that was sort of around 2 or 3% alcohol. It's basically a cheap cider for the masses. Mm-hmm. And workers were said to have drunk about half a gallon of this for breakfast, which is like two liters. Well, it's like 2 to 3%. It's basically like having a couple of, couple of drinks at breakfast, a couple of pints. I don't think I'm drinking two liters of any sort of liquid for breakfast. That's a lot of liquid. Yeah, but you're going to go out working in the field all day. Some big guys who are going out to work in the fields and they're drinking sort of two liters of this 2 to 3% alcohol. I mean, we know if you drink half-strength beer, you can drink two liters and you're basically not even drunk. Yep. It does nothing. So if these guys are drinking this every day, half a gallon for breakfast, they can't drink any water and they're going out in a hot field to tend the fields all day with the sun beating down. No, it makes sense. So they need some liquid. And of course, they didn't realize that alcohol was dehydrating back then. So (laughs) might not work so well. But anyway, after drinking their half gallon for breakfast, they also then took more with them so they could drink during the day. Of course. Why not? Keep your buzz on. Keep your buzz going. So... Yeah, that's it. So cider became like a drink for the people at that point, and everyone was drinking it. 
that's sort of like 18th century time. So Cider, its first post-Roman written record that we mentioned at the start there was 1204, and it was being used as a form of payment. But everything went very downhill in 1887 when the Truck Act prohibited the payment of wages with cider. And that was it. Government went, no more paying people in cider. And everyone went, say what? So could you pay people in other stuff or they just went 100% currency? Considering we still have barter exchanges today, I doubt that the Act prohibited all barter exchanges. I think they were pretty much saying like, you know, workers' rights, you can't just pay people in booze, you know. Oh, they were trying to do a good thing. Okay, I understand. <laughs> maybe. Maybe not. Well, I'm usually sure. if the government's involved, they're just trying to get their cut somehow. And they're like, well, you can't pay them in cider because I can't get my percentage of cider from them. <laughs> yeah. In the Where's long my run. cider? Where's my cider? <laughs> just, in, just in the House of Parliament. You need to going, pay your workers. Here is, so so yeah. where, where is my cider? I, I think if we can't get our cider, then we need, definitely, we need to have a new law that stops other people from getting their cider without our cut of cider. Otherwise, bring side of the House of Parliament now, please. And that's history. That's exactly how history worked. Rich people ruining it for everyone else. What you going to do? Anyway, that's just a brief rundown of some of the random events that happened during the history of I had of cider no in the UK. idea that the history of cider would be so old. Of course. I mean, it's alcohol. I, was, I thought it would have been like some farmers in the 1930s. <laughs> <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Not at all. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about modern production and, and what's changed since 1887, what's been happening now. And then also a little bit later on, we'll talk about the history of cider in the US because it's quite a different story from what happened through Europe and the UK. Right. Although through history, cider was simply made by pressing apples and then fermenting them, modern machinery changed everything as it has for the whole food industry. And it's led to mass-produced commercial ciders like Strongbow that we know today. Now, for legal reasons, I am not going to say that Strongbow is a company that does any of the stuff we're talking about after this. And I'm not going to name any companies that may or may not do these things in commercial ciders. This is just for information. I am very interested. And I have now. no idea which companies do and don't do this. Some people get sued for saying things that mass producers do when maybe they don't. We're not saying that anybody does this, but... Some people might. Some people might. And we don't know who. Do the following. I think it's important for consumers to know the difference because there's a big difference between commercially produced products with cider than with craft ciders. So and not that we're saying that commercially <laughs> produced <laughs> products all do this. We've never said anything. Forget, forget, forget. Forget, forget me now. You'll all get one in the mail very shortly. <laughs> we'll be all... getting a bottle of Strongbow in the mail because they never do anything bad. They're brilliant. And for legal reasons... They definitely don't do anything bad. This is just for information about some companies. So, first of all, the pretty obvious one is, of course, commercial ciders. They make very, very large batch production. It's not artisan production. Obviously, I mean, we Obviously, know that Obviously, that's, yeah, that's production 101. The bigger the, the batch, the... Higher the profit margin. Yeah, yeah, yeah the higher the profit margin, the, uh, the less quality. Here's one of the most important ones, though, is most commercial ciders are not made from fresh apples. They are made from an apple juice concentrate, which is then reconstituted in order to then be put in the vat. Boo. Yeah, so it's basically the worst of the worst leftover apples. We just apples. discussed how many apples there are in this world. Yeah. Just use apples. But this still costs them less because it's all the leftover apples that were too bruised to sell at market so they yeah. get the cheapest possible apples. Makes sense, right? It's, it's commercialism. And they often add a lot of additional sweeteners to speed up fermentation and increase alcohol content. Such Always as read the label. Cane sugar, for example. Yeah. They, just, they just throw it in. Um, they sometimes use artificial colors and flavors to enhance the taste and flavor rather than a natural cider. And of course, central production for large batches means that the product is shipped very long distances often around the world. So not great for Preservatives the environment. Preservatives as well. It's not great for the environment in general that they're sending these massive, heavy bottles of liquid in plastic and metal around the world. Yeah. Not particularly handy. What is their carbon footprint? Probably quite a lot. But, mm. you know, it's the same for a lot of production. So I'm not knocking commercial production completely. I'm just saying you should be aware that that's what it's like. Craft cider on the other hand, of course, much smaller batches, as you'd expect. And... One of the main focuses of Kraft Cider is fresh pressed apples. In fact, they may be picking their apples from outside their farm and they might be producing the cider on that farm. So it, it's about as local and natural as it gets. 
which is fantastic. Um, obviously, uh, they don't necessarily put very much sugar in. Some put some sugar in, depending on what they're trying to make, but they're not going to be adding as much. And a lot of cider producers don't add anything. They're just making the natural product as it used to be. They didn't used to add sugar to this. Originally, they didn't have to. No. Like, it's not completely necessary. Obviously, most craft cider producers won't add anything artificial. And also, they sell on a more local level rather than international. So you're more likely to be getting something that hasn't been transported long distances. They're probably putting it in glass bottles rather than plastic so they can be reused, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, the thing is you have to go to these locations to actually yeah. try it. And, I mean, that's what we promote through our blog and through this podcast is it's all food worth traveling for or booze worth traveling for. So you need to jump on a plane and go and experience this firsthand to get the best quality stuff. Which negates all the carbon footprint of having it delivered to you. So we've ruined everything. Uh... <laughs> You should just live in these places. That's, that's no the real No one wants to live way. in England. <laughs> Apart from- Even we don't want to live in England. <laughs> anyway, we're not an environmental podcast. How many new podcasts did we start today? Ontological, environmental, and some other- I never other- said I was starting an environmental podcast. I do my best, but I, I, I don't even know with the amount of travel we do. No, don't even want to think about terrible. it. So uh, the one downside, of course, is that uh, these- Small batches, they're made maybe from apples that aren't as consistent because they get different crops every year. So you might get different tasting ciders each year from the same batch. So we stopped off at the Bristol Cider Shop in the city of Bristol in the southwest of England because we wanted to try out some of these authentic local ciders that are still being made in a more traditional way. And we've got a clip. So let's go to that. Yep. Hey. So you were saying about specific cider apples. Are there certain names for any of those apples that people would know? Or there absolutely people? are. Um, so if you look at the bottles over here, there's a lot of single variety ones that are done by this particular farmer, Perry. So Morgan is one of them. So he names them all by their variety names. There's Red Streak, Dabinet. Dabinet's an extremely popular one. Um, I can see initially there's three single variety Dabinets here. And... There's going to be other ones where they blend them in. So I would say Davenant's probably the most popular one. People really love a Davenant. Um It probably has the smoothest flavour. Mm. And that's something that you'll see with them um, every year. They do a blind taste test for ciders yeah. at the Bath and Wax Show. And they have won three years in a row, Harry Cider have, with their Davenant one. So, so Davenant's a type of apple? Yes. I've yeah. never heard of that before. Because it's only used for making cider, apparently. Isn't it? That's, That's why. Yeah. So if you won't see it in the supermarket because they don't sell it. No, you don't need it. Yeah. And then we started our cider tasting, eventually making it to one of the most unusual offerings in the shop, Janet's Jungle Juice. Possibly one of the closest ciders in production today that could bear some resemblance to more ancient ciders. Janet's mm-hmm. Jungle Juice. Yeah, arguably has the funnest name. Yeah. <laughs> jungle Juice in like Thailand, it will... It's destroy you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the crazy stuff. So this is my favorite one. It's a really interesting one. And this is still medium dry? Yeah, still medium dry. So this is what I call the Marmite cider because you either love it or you hate it. <laughs> it doesn't taste like Marmite though. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm not loving it. Mm, no, I like that. It's totally, totally different. It reminds me of a. Oh, it's. It reminds it, me of the unpasteurized beer from George. Um, it does have wine a, from Georgia. a sort of yeasty hay aftertaste at the mm-hmm. end. Yeah, yeasty finish, but otherwise, but I like yeasty wine, unfiltered. So you know, makes sense. I like yeasty side. You do. Yeah. yeah. So this is a really interesting one because. <laughs> The guy who makes these, what he does every year, it, it, his batches completely vary because all he does is whatever grows, just picks them all and blends them all together. <laughs> oh, there you go. That is the, yeah. tradi- that's the most traditional possible way to yeah, make alcohol. Um, yeah, it is. It's, it's, yeah, because it's just, it's just whatever booze they've it got in. behind the counter mm-hmm. in that sense. Whatever yeah. apples they got on the tree, just throw them in. That's, Stalks yeah. and all, leaves, whatever you've got. <laughs> He's the only guy who does well. He's the only uh, craft cider uh, producer that does that. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, funny guy. <laughs> it's a cool niche to have if you're the only guy doing it. Yeah, it's true. And if people know what they're getting, and as you said, people either love it or they hate it. So if they love it, they're like, whatever. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But it's also I've, I've never had someone who tried it and just go, "It's all right." They either go, "Oh, I really love that," or oh, "That's vile." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's got a tang to it. It's got a tang, it's got the apple flavour, it's got the yeasty sort of flavour that I happen to like. Yeah, I'm a fan. One of my favourite ones so far. 
<laughs> All right. I hate my mic. And yet I poured mine into yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you hate it. So yeah, that was Janet's jungle juice. It was quite intense <laughs> and quite an unusual yeasty flavor. I loved it. Meg did not like it. I've never been a fan of the yeasty flavors, so it wasn't a great shock that I was not Janet's biggest fan. <laughs> But we did also try plenty of other less rustic craft ciders, uh, so don't be afraid to go try them. This was just the most extreme one that I found very interesting because of the, tri- the production method and the flavor was just crazy. Um, but there's lots of more sort of ones that, you know, they're still using local apples, they're still doing local production and small batches, but they're using more modern techniques. They're filtering things more and making a cleaner, more interesting cider. You have to think of it as like a wine tasting. You're not going to enjoy every wine you taste at a wine tasting. Cider tasting is exactly the same. Yeah, exactly. The Bristol Cider Shop has a very strict policy on only stocking ciders that are produced within a 50 mile radius of their store, which is in Bristol. And most of their craft range is actually unavailable in regular supermarkets because they stock all of these small scale producers. So you're actually going to find some very unique ciders that you just can't buy anywhere else. And they're also fully licensed. So as well as the tasting sessions, you can go and buy just a pint of cask cider. You can walk in, sit down on their little terrace and have a drink. If you visit England, go down there and you can go to the pub and you can quite often drink some cask ciders out of a barrel. Not just these commercial ciders. You can actually just find them in a regular pub as well. But anyway, if you want to get some more information on the Bristol Cider Shop and anything else we've discussed so far on this podcast, check out the show notes, foodfundtravel.com slash cider podcast, and you can get some more information on that. All right. Our final section today, we're talking about cider in the USA. The great American cider train rather than the European one. So I know even less about American cider than I know about English cider. So let's do this. Is because cider was not a big thing in the USA recently, but in the past, it was. Ah. Mm hmm. So before Europeans arrived in the Americas, they already had crab apples, just like everybody else. What is up with these apples? Crab apples. I tell you, the apples just went everywhere. It's like the meteor hit the earth and it made this backwards reaction like everything went in but apples came up it's because bears were eating them so they could like walk through alaska and poop everywhere and they just kept pooping oh, very roaming it's like the original nomads it's crazy I don't, it's probably not all bears but you know anyway they had they've had crab apples in north america the whole time as well they didn't have our modern apples until uh europe invaded yeah. when europe went over and took over the u.s then that's when they got our modern versions of apples European style apples. But cider was not being produced by the natives from crab apples. I don't know if they used them for anything, if they just ignored them, but they were not making cider. Okay. That is for sure. So some sources claim that the very first apple trees from Europe were planted in 1607 in the US in Jamestown, Virginia. That's probably not no, Virginia accent. But you know, whatever. Whatever. Other sources claim that it was Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1629 who planted their grafts of apples. So yes, they brought branches across from Europe and they planted the branches. They might have planted some seeds as well. It's not really completely clear. But either way, apples became a really important crop and cider but actually became the number one, the absolute number one most drunk alcoholic beverage in the USA at that time. Wow. So heading for the 17th, 18th century, late 17th into the 18th century, that's what was happening. It was all cider. Because these apples were just growing everywhere. They were easy to grow. It was the perfect climate. So just throwing the apple trees down and it became super popular. And of course, because they had no clean drinking water, even the children were drinking it. Of course. Of course they were. Yes, it helps them go to sleep at night. Yep. <laughs> and all day. <laughs> yeah. People just, this is why human society took so long to become massively, massively technologically advanced because everyone was drunk. I think it's also the problem today with why we have so many ADHD kids is because no one's boozing their kids anymore. It could be, yeah. So we've Controversial. <laughs> it's not, no one's giving them that rum to go to sleep with anymore, but we will give them a hefty dose of medication. And as well as the kids drinking cider, rural communities were also paying their taxes people's wages and tithes to the church with cider. <laughs> so, cider was currency, boozy currency, yep. just like it was in England. That's worked for a while. I actually, I don't know if you have it in your notes, but I've read that for many years in, I do know in England, but I don't know about the States, but I guess it'd probably be the same, that kids were actually baptized in cider because 
the water was not clean. So they would baptize them in cider and be like, you know, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, and, you know, don't drink too much on the way down. Boozy baby. Boozy babies. Uh, I don't know. Sticky I have not babies. seen this. <laughs> sticky babies. If it's like a low alcohol cider, it might be less sticky. Yeah, I, I don't guess. know. I read it somewhere that, yeah, they were baptizing kids in it because, uh, yeah, the water was not clean. So, yeah, America was big on the cider and big on the apples very quickly. It just, they grew. So it was perfect. Let's, let's make lots of food. And actually, one of America's biggest folk heroes, Johnny Appleseed, took it as his mission in life to create new orchards across America so that no one in America would ever go hungry again because there would always be apples at least. What was his original name? So actually his original name is John Chapman and he was not Johnny Appleseed, but he Uh. became Johnny Appleseed because he was the apple guy. And today John Um, Chapman is a very different person. We don't have to reference serial killers on every part of the show. He only killed one person, but, oh, you know, that's fine, he, he went big. He went, like, go hard or go home with his killing of John Lennon. Uh, so that's probably why they changed his name <laughs> from Johnny Appleseed <laughs> to John They're Chapman. Like, this can't be an American hero. What can we call him? Oh, we'll call him Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> But unlike most of the apple trees that had been planted in the US at that point, which were grown from grafts taken from trees in Europe, Johnny Appleseed, and hence the name Appleseed, was the one who went around planting trees from actual seeds because he believed that's what nature intended. So he's like, I'm just going to go plant seeds, which takes a bit longer, but it's... Hey, if more people went around planting seeds, it wouldn't be a terrible thing. Actually, there's an amazing reason why this is so brilliant that he planted seeds rather than grafts. If you plant a graft, then the tree that is born out of that is basically a clone of the original tree. Now, apples actually have a unique DNA that is more complicated than human DNA. They actually, when they reproduce, new trees that are born of apple seeds are so different from the original tree and can be so different compared to humans. It actually more variation. You can taste an apple from a tree that is grown from a seed from the previous tree, and the two apples will taste completely different. It, they have crazy DNA in trees. So when we talked earlier about the fact that America has all of these apples that are actually native to America, even though they came from Kazakhstan originally, it's because when he started growing all of these trees from seeds, they created all these new apples. So it just absorbed a different type of soil, different sort of no, nutrients. No, it's nothing to do with the soil. It's the no? DNA of the seed. Oh. The seeds that are created from apple trees create trees that then grow apples that are very different from the original tree. Wow. So, so his mission, humans. he invented new apples inadvertently by planting seeds rather than grafts. Crazy. So, yeah, a lot of the apples we have today and a lot of the ones that are most popular in the U.S. are because he went out and planted seeds rather than grafts. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So, And we're going to clarify that he planted them. He didn't just go nomadic like the bears. Uh, no, he, he didn't plant them with his bottom. Okay, good. No, he, uh, he went around to a lot of different places all around and he just started planting them. Uh, he gave seeds to people and it was his mission just to plant all over the U.S. That's fantastic. Yeah. Good on, go, Johnny. So from 1792 until 1842, Johnny traveled all around America planting seeds and he helped to grow thousands of new productive apple trees. And from that, more cider. So more cider was coming out of him. But by the late 1800s, which was after he died, he died in the mid 1800s, uh, cider began its decline as being the most popular beverage in the USA, partly because of the Industrial Revolution, which took people away from farms and country living to work in the cities. So orchards were abandoned, uh, which resulted in less production, and the unfiltered and unpasteurized cider that would normally be stored maybe in a cellar to keep it at a temperature so it didn't go off, trying to transport that then to cities where there was no refrigeration, they had problems and the cider wouldn't travel well. And instead, they had a lot of immigrants coming in from Ireland and Germany to the US at that point, late 1800s, and they went beer, beer, beer. And by this point, those areas of the Midwest that were growing a lot of grain, very easy to grow a lot of grain, and it travels really well. It keeps really well. Yeah. They were just sending that back to the east and whatever. So people living in cities were making beer, and that was like, that's a much better production standard, and it keeps, beer keeps quite well. Lager keeps very well. So that was it. 
And the final nail in the coffin for cider was actually the temperance movement. And by the time Prohibition was enacted in 1920, the production of cider in the US had slipped to only 13 million gallons a year compared to in 1899 when it was 55 million gallons. Mm. So, yeah, that combination, plus people going like, you shouldn't drink so much, that was it. It was uh, no, all over. they were like, you can't drink. Yeah. Not well, you shouldn't drink so much. Well, <laughs> You're not allowed to no, drink. No, but it, it's pre-prohibition where people were like, you shouldn't drink so much, and uh, then eventually prohibition happened. The production had just slipped so much, and by the time prohibition finished, it just never came back. However, the good news is today it is starting to come back, and people in the U.S., obviously there's loads of apples there still, Cider production is starting to be a thing again. I was wondering if it would, because obviously craft beer is massive in the United States at the moment. And, you know, even in, in England and Australia, alongside hand in hand with the craft beer revolution has been cider. It's not been as strong, but it's just kind of been like an offshoot. And they're like, oh, this is like the cider we're making on the side. So I, I had wondered if it was a thing that was going on in the States as well. Yeah, well, um, apparently it is now. So that's awesome. Nice. More craft cider, more naturally produced ciders. Uh, sounds pretty fantastic. Yeah, we'll have to go over and try some. Anyone want to invite us over for cider? <laughs> we'll come over and we'll do another podcast on fully on American cider and today's influences and, you know, how you can mix it with tones of raspberry. Tweet us at Food Fun Travel. And let us know if you produce cider yourself in the US or anywhere, really, and you're producing craft cider. We'd be really excited to hear from you. All right. Well, that's it. We've looked at the history of apples, which was quite crazy. I had no idea. 50 million years of apples at least, and at least 6,000 years of modern apples. Yeah, and not, not a single dinosaur got to try one. Poor dinosaurs didn't eat apples. Mm. Poor them. They could, have, they could have transported apples really far. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they would have done better than the bears. So, yeah, it's at 50 million, 50 million years of apple history, 6,000 years of apple human history, at least, and uh, at least 2,000 years of cider making history. And probably the Celts in England yeah. were the ones who really popularized it. But maybe not. Maybe not. We just don't know. People could have just been drinking it in their farm. There could be some just like drunk farmer off in some farmstead somewhere going like, I'm not telling anyone how I made this. <laughs> this is all mine. I don't know why he's Northern Irish or I don't know what accent that was. A little bit, little bit Irish, a little, little bit something else. You know what? Everyone, right. I'm sure, sure the accents were not quite as defined back then as they are today. So, you know. Yeah. Irish Somerset. I'm going with that was Irish Somerset. All right. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah, that's it. Check out the show notes, foodfuntravel.com slash cider podcast. And also, if you want to become a patron and help us make more shows, because right now we're doing, I don't know, we're doing like 10 or 12 a year, but we could be doing more than double that and researching more foods and more drinks and more interesting things if we had more funding for this. So you can, you can be a patron from $1.50 a month, and that gets you some bonuses as well. We've got some episodes on Worcestershire sauce. Yes, which is actually more interesting than you'd think. Yeah. And actually, we, we've sort of delved into condiments a bit with our mini episodes, and they actually have kooky backgrounds that you would not believe. Yeah, Tabasco sauce as well. It's one of our mini bonus episodes for patrons. So come join us at foodfundtravel.com slash extras. That will send you to our Podbean account, which has our Patreon information. You can sign up for $1.50 a month and get those bonus episodes. Plus, like, the main thing is it means we're going to make more shows. If we hit our targets and we get some funding from you guys, we're going to be able to sit back and go, yep, we've got a bit more time to do this. We don't have to work as hard on the blog. And we can just do more podcasts, which would be awesome. Yep. And uh, the main thing, as you guys know, is we like to actually travel to these destinations and speak to the people firsthand, which uh, is not cheap. Yep. But, uh, you know, if you ever wanted to, you know, buy us a cider, <laughs> then uh, please do. Uh, we, you know, any sort of contribution is very greatly appreciated. Don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you listen. Five stars is good. Anything less than five stars, don't leave us a review. Listen to a different show. If you don't like the show that much, you know, listen to something else. What are you doing? What are you doing? You've got a limited amount of time in this life. And Stop don't be one of those it. people on Amazon that thinks one star's the best. What's up with these people that's like, best product I've ever bought? I use it every day. One star. Well, they probably drink a gallon of cider a day. <laughs> 17th century people who just learned how to use the internet drink a gallon of cider and then go, one star. I love this book. <laughs> But also people that think like, one is the best. I'm number one. I must leave one star. They're number one. 
bizarre. Anyway. Since what do they think five is, where it's like all filled out and beautiful? I don't know. I, I've never understood it. it. It doesn't make any sense. So you can't help people all the time, can you? No. Anyway, you that, can help us by leaving us a yeah, five-star review. Just help us. $1.50 a month. Cost you barely nothing, but it makes a big difference to us. So, cool. That's the end of the Cider episode. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, head over to Bristol and head over to the southwest of England. It's some of the best cider production in the world. Beautiful. Real good craft ciders. Be- you know, a lot of people just visit London, but that area of England is really beautiful and it's a really booming foodie t- like area as well. You'd be very, very impressed with some of the food, especially if you're vegetarian or vegan. They are doing some really great stuff that really accommodates all uh, food types. So uh, get but on over there. They also have fantastic dairy and they also have amazing pork. <laughs> Yes, so, they do. Yeah. West Country pork they, and West Country saying. bacon. They do it's a thing. Everyone. All, they, there's something for everyone in that region. I, I doubt that anyone would go away hungry or sober. Yeah. All right. Catch you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to The Dish. Don't forget to subscribe and keep this podcast on the air by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you listen. Also, come join our foodie community on Facebook in the Food Worth Travelling For Facebook group. Catch you next time.